So Adrian uh, Murphy is um, a medical oncologist at Hopkins, and he's graciously um, volunteered to be our first host of our Zoom meeting. Um, so we're really thankful for that. You're very welcome. It's my pleasure. Um, I've heard a lot about your support group, Tam, and I'm really honored to be here. And just wish it was in person when, like we originally discussed, I thought it would be a better environment. So I really appreciate everybody joining on Zoom, even though it's not as good as the real thing, as we all know, just like a graduation. Um, so I'm going to cover some topics that are really quite hot and give a, a bird's eye view level of them um, just to lead some discussion hopefully later and just to give um, some ideas as to what's happening in the rectal cancer or colorectal cancer world and things that may be coming in the, in the future. Um, so one of the big um, changes that has happened really in the last five to ten years is how we classify um, and you can include colon and rectal cancer because it's um, considered equivalent in this sense and Historically, the way that colorectal cancer has been staged or classified is, is really based on the anatomical location of where the tumor is through the, through the bowel wall. And to some extent, we still use that, but we now go a little deeper in, in terms of that um, classification. So the original classification began in the 1930s, believe it or not, when they noted that a tumor that penetrated more deeply through the bowel wall had a worse prognosis than one that didn't penetrate as deeply. And they said that one of the really interesting comments is this one on the very bottom. And this is by Duke, who was the pathologist who made this discovery and described this very meticulously in his, own, his um, series. He was a pathologist in a hospital in London. And he said that the results of surgical treatment in C cases are very disappointing. So C became stage three, where you have lymph node involvement. And of course, back in the 1930s, they did not have chemotherapy. Uh, I'm biased as a medical oncologist, but we do know that chemotherapy um, certainly improves survival very significantly in stage three or Duke C um, colorectal cancer. But that was the, um, one of the first descriptions of how we even classify colorectal cancer based on his work. So then that evolved um, hugely to become a very complicated algorithm that you see here on the right. Um, using the TNM, which means the tumor node and metastasis, I'm sorry, um, classification, which was very loosely based on Duke's original classification. And that gave us stages one, two, three, and four, based on which stage of the um, TN and, and then M. So the, the ball wall, just like Duke's 930s. No N is answer no had and one verse more than four versus more than seven positive nodes that um, gave you a higher nodal status. And then M stands for metastasis or secondary spread, secondary spread um, of the cancer. Of the cancer. Um, so that then moved again about 10 years ago into looking at colorectal cancer very differently, looking at the specific molecular types. So we used to always branch all of the colorectal cancers as whether they were a stage one, two, three, or four. We now know that there's a huge amount of heterogeneity at the molecular genetic level. And that's something that we use probably more for later stage um, colon and rectal cancer, but it really um, impacts how we um, make decisions and um, particularly for stage four colorectal cancer. So there have been many, many studies looking at various categories um, which can tell you a lot about the inheritor of tumor, whether it has certain genetic mutations, this one called BRAF, for which there are now targeted therapies that target the BRAF mutation. Um, KRAS is also important for making decisions about certain treatments that we can give. And um, another really important one we'll talk about later is MSI high, which is microsatellite unstable, and, and which is a very close connection to the responsiveness of the tumor to immunotherapy, which is, of course, is very hot at the moment. Um, how, how does this affect us in everyday practice? So particularly for um, later stage tumors, um, we do very much pay close attention to what the pathologist um, tells us what the tumor looks like under the microscope. But nowadays, we don't just stop at that. As an oncologist, we always look for more information. And we look for um, essentially what is the, the signature, the genetic signature 
of an individual tumor because they vary, as we like to say, from each other as we do. So they're very, very individual. And nowadays we have a plat variety of platforms that we can request more um, detailed testing of over 400 genes, whether they're mutated, whether there are things called gene fusions and um, the exact mutation. So treating um, colon or rectal cancer has become a lot more complicated than it used to be because now you have to know a lot more about the genetics of the tumor and very specifically as an oncologist, you have to know about the treatment decision-making um, consequences of each of these genetic alterations. Um, and ex this um, thing on the right is an example of one of the platforms called Foundation. This is a, a sample, this is not a real person's um, thing, just for HIPAA, since we're not recording each other, um, we're also not putting up real patients' um, details. So this gives us um, a very quick view of the exact um, relevant mutations. So every single tumor will have mutations. What matters to an oncologist is what the specific mutations are, and, and in particular, what mutations there are that we can target with, with drugs in particular, or okay. know to avoid certain Followed drugs because of those. So I'm going to um, move on to talking about some updates in rectal cancer treatment. So I'm very very specifically talking about rectal cancer here, not colon cancer. So one of the, um, the main components, at least in Hopkins, of our um, decision-making is the Multidisciplinary Tumor Board, which you probably are aware of. This is a um, weekly meeting. Um, could everyone just mute themselves um, so that I can hear just hearing a lot of background? Um, and you're on, please unmute yourselves at the end of, our, uh, of the presentation or if you have a question. Um, thank you. So the Multidisciplinary Tumor Board consists of a whole variety of people. Currently, like this format, we're meeting on Zoom and or a similar platform. And we have representation from all of the major disciplines that it requires to take care of a patient with rectal cancer. So we have usually more than one colorectal surgeon. We have several medical oncologists. We have radiation oncologists present. We have a pathologist and radiologist who we're really fortunate come every week, the same person, so that they are um, literally experts in the pathology of rectal cancer and the imaging of rectal cancer. We have um, a whole spectrum of people, of nurse practitioners and specialists from all of the associated specialties who are really the, the spider's web connecting everyone together to make sure that patients are, are really well taken care of. For um, certain cases, we have special type of surgeons. So we may have a neurosurgeon or a liver surgeon or a um, peritoneal surgeon. Um, and ideally, although we don't have this in, at our Hopkins forum right now, ideally a clinical geneticist um, would be wonderful to have. We do have very close connections with our clinical genetics team, but they're quite stretched and not able to come to our weekly meetings, but we have a very low threshold to refer people if we feel it's necessary. So this um, slide um, really summarizes the old and the new. So the top um, part of the slide is the, the old. It's the way that we used to um, approach the preoperative treatment for rectal cancers. So um, most rectal cancers require what we call downstaging or treatment ahead of surgical resection. And the reason for that is that rectal cancers um, without treatment before surgery have a propensity to recur in their local area, which is very different from colon cancer, which, which doesn't have that um, additional step. Um, rectal cancers, we have to remember, are quite deep down in the pelvis, surrounded very tightly by a lot of other organs in the pelvis. So they need a lot of downstaging to make sure that they're um, free from those surrounding structures and that the chances of surgery are maximized. So the way that we used to do this was um, by giving radiation on a Monday through Friday over a five to six week course. And we would combine capecitabine, which is an oral chemotherapy drug on the days of radiation treatment. So in this instance, the radiation treatment was the primary modality of treatment and the chemotherapy was an add-on. So, because it's not really possible to give full dose radiation and full dose chemotherapy at the same time, because it would be very toxic. And um, afterwards, then we would repeat the scans and do a comparison and then go to the surgery and then Depend, the vast majority of people would be offered a period of chemotherapy of usually about four months. In this instance, the chemotherapy was 
100% chemotherapy, so you'll be getting often a combination of drugs. And um, there was emerging data coming from in various international centers that this treatment could be really optimized because there were um, a lot of efforts to try and intensify the treatment or at least change the sequence of the treatment to reduce the risk of cancer coming back in its original area or in another part of the body. So courtesy of our multidisciplinary clinic and the fact that we see each other all the time, it was became possible to propose these new changes and to implement them and implement them as an entire unit. And I would say that was probably the principal reason that we were able to do this. So our modality changed completely to um, include a, a, a brief treatment for radiation treatment, which is still a, um, a high dose. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Sorry, my radio, my, I just got a message on my internet was unstable. So sometimes I lose um, Wi-Fi when that happens, I apologize. Um, so the radiation treatment, what we call five by five because it involves five days of, of five gray each and um, is given over five days as it, the name suggests. So you're finished in a, in a week and that radiation is given on its own. So we don't combine chemotherapy with that at that, at that um, point of time. Um, then we follow by chemotherapy. In that instance, we're giving the um, more than one drug of chemotherapy. So you're getting 100% of chemotherapy. And that is given currently over three months. Um, then we repeat your scans. And then we go to surgery and then complete chemotherapy afterwards. So we do three months of chemotherapy before surgery and three months afterwards. And so in this instance, you're getting the, be the best of both worlds. You're getting radiation treatment but you're also getting more intense chemotherapy ahead of surgery. Yeah, so surgery. you sort of split it out so you're not having to get all of it um, immediately after the surgeries. These are the results. This is um, presented at um, our, the largest oncology conference in the world, which is called ASCO, American Society of Clinical Oncology, which happened to be um, last week or weekend before last. And this was done virtually, like everything else had to be done, which is quite a new uh, change for all of us. Um, and I'm just giving a representation of one large study which looked at a very similar approach. And if you look at the numbers, that's, and we can see that in the new approach that we see um, almost 20% versus 27% in terms of distant metastasis. So that tells us that the cancer cells were potentially being killed off at the stage before they were able to travel to other parts of the body. And this was very significant. What they call local regional failure, which means how, many, how much recurred in the same area. So we can see six to nine percent. And theoretically, that was higher in the new approach, but that was not significant. So that's actually not considered a true result. And then overall, what's called treatment failure. So whether it comes back in either locally or distantly was lower. So 24 versus 30 percent in the new approach. So this was after three years of follow up, which is considered quite an early um, point to, um, to assess any changes. So one of the difficulties about changing something um, in rectal cancer, particularly in the preoperative way that we do things, is that it can take a very long time for the results to show a significant difference. So we're already seeing um, a change in three years. It's quite plausible that the longer that these are followed up, we'll see an even greater difference. But the overall um, message is that these changes, um, even though they may seem quite small changes, are having a significant impact um, on, the on patients in terms of the success of these um, shrinking down of the tumors and their prevention of um, spreading of the cancer to other parts of the body. So we have also published our own um, institutional experience, which I just included here from one of the radiation oncology um, residents compiled a database that we're keeping. Um, looking at our own um, institutional um, difference because things can vary from one institution to another. So we keep a very firm eye on what's happening in our own. And we have seen anecdotally and very objectively by using the database, we have seen quite a marked difference in the control that we're getting with our new approach. And we're constantly um, looking at improving or changing our approach um, originally, when we started, we did two months of chemotherapy ahead of um, surgery. Now we're doing three months. The reason that we have to do um, things in increments is for safety. So we, can't, we know that if we make very large changes, we could have a significant difference in safety. And we have to make sure that all of the components of our 
our regimen work together. So for example, if we're making uh, quite a large change in the preoperative treatment of rectal cancer, there is the potential for there to be further problems during surgery or recovery from surgery. So we have to be um, very cautious in our approach and, and do this with safety ultimately as our primary goal. For anybody who's more is interested in learning more about this five by five protocol, Dr. Safar, who's the chief of colorectal surgery here, who some of you may know, um, has a YouTube video on it that you're you're welcome to to go and watch, where he very um, succinctly describes this protocol and his experiences with it. Um, this, until very recently, was really the absolute minority in the United States um, to be done for the preoperative treatment for rectal cancer. So rectal cancer, I mentioned, requires chemotherapy and radiation treatment before surgery. Um, a new paradigm or new thought is about not doing surgery. So for selected people who have a really good response um, from their preoperative treatment, which will be judged by the CT scan, MRI, and at least a flex sigmoidoscopy, there is the option of doing what is called watch and wait, which is multiple other terms if you're reading um, the internet, such as non-operative surveillance or organ preservation with the organ being the rectum, of course. And that is something that we do on a case-by-case -case basis. This is one of the huge advantages of um, presenting people at our multidisciplinary um, conference, that we all get to look at the scans together, discuss the pathology, discuss our um, joined consensus decision about individual cases so that you're not just getting one person's opinion, you're getting a collective opinion from all across the institution of and the specialties that are involved. Um, this is quite a new way of doing things, at least in the United States. Um, and there are, of course, concerns that um, we could be um, allowing small cells of cancer that are not going to be visible on an MRI or CT scan to be growing and maybe spread to other, other parts of the body. So watch and wait is not for everyone. It's certainly a long conversation that um, a person who has been Offer, at least offered the option for it and um, should have with their surgeon and their oncologists. Another concept that has been broached a lot more commonly in this field is the concept of total neoadjuvant therapy, which is often called by its acronym TNT. So the current standard, if you remember from my um, older slide, is where we have treatment before surgery, surgery, and then treatment after surgery. Um, so the difference in total neoadjuvant therapy is that you do everything before surgery and therefore you're done by the time you have surgery. And there are a lot of um, advantages to that because in general, chemotherapy is easier to tolerate before surgery. Some of you may know. Um, so the toxicity could be lower by doing total neoadjuvant therapy. But of course, every adjustment we make to our paradigm really has to be judged by very objective criteria, such as the response rate. Is the response the same or hopefully better than the older way of doing things? And ultimately survival. So do people live um, longer and is their survival um, impacted by having total neoadjuvant therapy? Survival, as I mentioned earlier, is a very long thing to, to, um, to mature in this space. Um, so it takes many years to judge the impact of, of a new change on, on survival. Um, we haven't adopted that as of yet. I think in the future we may do. Um, we're still in the consideration stage of this and really waiting for more data. Again, because it's about safety and making sure that we're doing the right thing for all of our patients. This is one of the studies that has been done internationally um, to judge the impact of total neoadjuvant therapy. So there are various arms where you get surgery and then you get, you can, in some, in some arms of the study, get radiation and surgery. So also the permutations that are there. So this study is still ongoing and it's going to be many years before we have the final results and particularly for survival from this prospect study. Another um, issue, which is more of a surgical issue, which of course is not my expertise as an oncologist, um, but for very early stage or sometimes for very large rectal polyps, there is the option of performing a minimally invasive surgery. So not something that, in that involves a scar, something that can be done from internally in the rectum. And Dr. Fang is one of our amazing surgeons who pioneered and is an expert in this approach. And um, that's gonna be something that would be offered only if you um, meet the quite strict criteria for that um, particular approach. But it has a lot of advantages because it's minimally invasive and doesn't involve a scar. 
So immunotherapy is something that is, um, we're asked a lot about as oncologists because there are a lot of TV commercials promoting immunotherapy, particularly for lung cancer and melanoma, which were some of the original cancers that they were found to be really effective for. Um, and immunotherapy is very different from chemotherapy in that these are drugs which really manipulate your own immune system to try and fight the cancer for you, as opposed to re receiving an external drug and being delivered to do that job. So essentially tumor cells being very clever are able to bind to the um, in marauding immune cells that are floating around in your bloodstream. And they're able to trick them or deactivate them into um, believing that they are part of your a normal cell of your body, that they are no different. Whereas in fact, they are quite different because of all of the genetic alterations and because of their capacity to divide more frequently than a, a, not a normal cell and even spread to another part of the body, such as the lymph node. What immunotherapy does, and immunotherapy is very much an umbrella term, there are many different types of immunotherapy, but in general, immunotherapy drugs will break that connection between a tumor and a T cell, which is a type of immune cell. And it will therefore allow, at least in theory, the tumor to be recognized by the immune cell and then hopefully attacked and killed off by the, um, by the immune cell. So that's the way that they're really allowing the, your own body or your, your own immune cells to kill the cancer cells. Um, so it's not really the drug doing the killing as with chemotherapy. So one of the huge advantages of immunotherapy is that once you break that connection, you, there is the potential that there will be a very long-term effect. Because once you switch on the immune system, it's quite difficult to switch it off and that it can continue working long after you've given your drug. And this was really exciting early on when it thought that all tumors could respond this way, but unfortunately that's, that's not the case. Dr. Lee, who's one of our medical oncologists here at Hopkins, was one of the um, seminal people who discovered that you had to have a very specific type of um, colon or rectal cancer for that to be the case. And that colorectal cancers in general are not like lung cancers or melanoma or kidney cancers, which are the things that the TV commercials are based on, that you are required to have a type of signature called MSI high, which is an unstable genetic signature for it to respond. And if we look here on the right, this is a, what's called a waterfall plot. So each of these is a, a patient. And this is the response rate. So this, this particular patient over here had a minus, let's say, 60 or 70 percent growth. So that means that it shrank and by 70 percent from the beginning of the clinical trial to the end of it. And if you look, the vast majority of the people who are in below the line, meaning that they all responded to immunotherapy, were blue or black, meaning that they had mismatched repair deficient, which is another term for microsatellite unstable. And then if you had the red, which was unfortunately the vast majority of colorectal cancers, you were far less likely to respond, at least um, in a dramatic way. Um, so that's why we, we do all of this testing on every patient who has at least stage four cancer in particular, so that we can um, make a judgment as to whether they're likely to respond to immunotherapy or not. And that has become part of our routine testing. So every patient with um, stage four cancer will be um, tested for that in our lab. This is um, another more dramatic way of looking at the impact of immunotherapy um, in the selected patients. So this is a CT scan and this is your liver. This is your spleen, part of your stomach and a blood vessel. And these dark areas here represent tumors. So you can see there are multiple tumors throughout the liver. This is the normal light gray colored um, tumor here in the background. Um, so between one and two, the patient had received chemotherapy. So you can see some difference, um, certainly going in the right direction. Whereas if you look at number three, you'll see quite a dramatic improvement. Um, and that's one of the limitations of chemotherapy in stage four colon cancer, that it's not going to unfortunately cure it. It can certainly treat it and work um, for most people. But to get this type of response, if you compare one and three, it would require immunotherapy and more importantly, requires the, patient, the tumor to have that specific genetic um, signature that will respond to immunotherapy. So uh, only three to 5% of patients with advanced, that is stage four colorectal cancer, will have this MSI high. 
And there are a number of clinical trials working on the vast majority, which is called NSS or microsatellite stable, trying to replicate what happens with immunotherapy and the other subtype and try to get them to increase their responsiveness by combining immunotherapy agents or what are called immunomodulators with immunotherapy, really working hard to understand what's happening in the tumor microenvironment that makes them respond or does not allow them to respond and to see if we can manipulate that um, to get them to respond to immunotherapy. One other topic that is quite hot in the field of colorectal cancer is what is called young adult onset colorectal cancer. So um, it has a specific definition of someone who is aged less than 50. And the reason why that's become really hot is because we are seeing um, a huge number, and Tam, of course, will know this more than anyone, in the number of patients that are presenting to our clinics, not just in Hopkins, but across the, the United the States and the world, with young onset colorectal cancer. And this is very important because these patients will often have the exact same symptoms that older patients will have, but there are many studies reporting that they're less likely to be taken seriously by their primary care physician or provider, um, and they're therefore more likely to present later or more advanced stage of cancer because of this. Um, so there's been a lot of effort to try and increase um, the idea that young onset colorectal cancer is, is a thing and is a very important thing. And as the message here from the Colorectal Cancer Alliance says, the truth is you're never too young. And one in 10 of all cases are now diagnosed in those who are aged less than 50. And that is hugely increased from 10, 20 years ago. Um, and if you look at the numbers, they're quite scary in that many patients were initially misdiagnosed. So 82% of patients in this survey were misdiagnosed. Some more were diagnosed at a later stage. Many felt their symptoms were ignored. Um, we often think when younger patients um, present, we often assume that there is a genetic reason for that, there's a hereditary reason. And in truth, less than 10% of colorectal cancer is hereditary, meaning that 90% is environmental, which um, we don't specifically know the exact reason for at, a, at the individual level why something happened. And um, also, scarily, two-thirds of patients saw at least two doctors before their diagnosis. So there's been, like I said, a lot of um, effort to try and improve the idea that colorectal cancer can happen at any age and should be, if symptoms are suggestive, it should be um, taken seriously. So there are some very specific issues for young adult onset colorectal cancer. And fertility, I've mentioned, is often far, far more important in this um, young, younger group for obvious reasons. Um, radiation and chemotherapy can affect fertility. And um, very often these patients need to see a specialist such as a reproductive endocrinologist or a GYN if, if they're female or an andrologist if they're male to um, discuss their options, which can in some cases, particularly in females, delay treatment. Um, we have a very good system within Hopkins. We have people who are well used to receiving referrals and TAM in particular has very good connections with all of our um, reproductive health providers who really try and minimize that delay between being seen, having eggs harvested and preserved if that's what, what a person wants and feels they need and then beginning treatment. Um, genetic testing, so um, although most of the young adult onset um, patients are not associated with a hereditary cause, there is a higher proportion of them than all, the total number of patients who do have a hereditary cause. So um, it is more likely that a patient of this age will, um, will be required to see a genetic counselor and undergo formal genetic testing. Um, unlike testing the tumor for its genetic signature, um, genetic testing where you're testing either a swab from your cheek or a blood test, as a whole other emotional aspect to it, as you can imagine. So it's not something that you can just go into lightly. It, it does require a process of meeting a genetic counselor and, and speaking with them about the pros and cons of, of doing that. And I've listed research here because, um, because of this relative explosion in numbers and the real um, confusion as to why this is happening. 
we really are trying to focus on the reasons behind this. And one of the ideas that has been promoted in the recent past is generating a young adult onset colorectal cancer clinic that is specific, that would have all of the specific components, such as fertility and genetics, and also combined research efforts. Um, in the same way that our multidisciplinary clinic has um, led to evolutions and improvements in our care, we're hoping that a young adult onset clinic would, would do the same and, and um, not just for those in our local area, but across the, the United States and, and hopefully world and collaborating with other centers who are doing similar efforts. So I'm gonna finish up with um, some new ways of detecting colorectal cancer. So as many of you may know that when you're finished all of your chemotherapy and you're in remission from your rectal cancer treatment, we are quite limited in the ways that we can tell if you're cancer free or not. Right now we have CTs, we have blood tests and they're all imperfect. They're the best that we currently have. And of course, um, follow-up surveillance colonoscopies are, are really important. Um, you may hear a lot about liquid biopsies, which are blood tests or no, relatively non-invasive ways of um, telling whether a cancer is present. So every, every tumor has its own genetic signature. So it is possible to delineate that signature, figure out what it is, and then find components of that signature in your blood. And there are multiple different ways of doing that. One is that if you have active cancer, you're likely to have some free floating cells of that cancer in your bloodstream and you can actually measure um, those using certain technology. Another way, and they're called circulating tumor cells or CTCs. Another way is called cell-free DNA and that's probably the latest um, invention where when your cancer cell um, degrades, which they all do eventually, a part of that DNA will be free floating in your bloodstream. And that's a way of being able to match that against the genetic signature of your tumor. Um, so these have recently been heralded as the, a new way or a potential new way. They're not really at for prime time yet. So they, um, every new technology or every new test has to undergo a huge amount of testing and validation for it to be certified and, and passed by the FDA to make sure that it's adequately sensitive and specific. Because if you're introducing a new test like this, as an oncologist, we need to be really confident that, um, that we are um, using that, that information at appropriate times. So when, one of the questions that just came up there is how often? So, um, since they're done by blood tests, you can do them um, very often. There are clinical trials that have been done for more advanced um, stages of cancer where they're doing them with every cycle of, of chemotherapy. Right now, their use is limited to clinical trials because that's how we figure out all of these really good questions and how we answer them scientifically. Um, because the stakes are very high, if we are gonna use the results of a test to change a treatment or stop a treatment, we need to be very convinced that that treatment actually represents what it says it does. Um, so hopefully in five plus years time, we will have this technology as an everyday tool, just like now we have the genetic testing, which would have been almost a pipe dream 10 years ago. So certainly um, we're all upscaling all the time and trying to incorporate these new technologies to um, help us with decision-making and um, help us with all sorts of things like prognostication and determining somebody's prognosis also. Um, so this is another way of how um, it can work. So for somebody who is late stage um, cancer, which has gone from the colon to the liver, for example, the process of using a liquid biopsy would be that you would get a, a tissue biopsy, just like you would at the time of diagnosis. You would then figure out what the genetic signature of that tumor is, either there or in the liver, for example. You would then look for the matched part of that in the blood so that you would be able to say what you're picking up in the blood matches what's in the tumor. Um, let's say then a patient gets treatment and develops what's called primary resistance, so that they become resistant to the chemotherapy or treatment that they're on. Um, in lung cancer, for example, they're where they're quite ahead in terms of immunotherapy and liquid biopsies, they've shown that they can pick up it resistance um, or, response or response in the blood ahead of seeing it on the scan, for example. So that's um, thereby preventing people getting unnecessary treatment or even too much treatment 
for example. And as the, the tumor progresses or grows over time, it may also change its genetic signature, which can then be picked up in the liquid biopsy. And that is the, the essential, the dream of um, those who are doing a lot of research in liquid biopsies, that they could ultimately um, function as a surrogate for doing more invasive biopsies of your colon, liver, lungs, or wherever the cancer happens to be. <clears throat> so I'm going to just conclude with some comments, the things that we've discussed already. Um, so we've all discussed how there's a lot more emphasis on the molecular changes and colon cancer and how we classify individual cancers based on those individual uh, signatures because of how truly heterogeneous they are when you compare one to the other. Um, speaking very specifically about rectal cancer, to manage rectal cancer in a high quality fashion requires truly multidisciplinary care. And we see that all the time. And we are incredibly fortunate that we have a really wonderful collaborative group here at Hopkins um, where we work and alongside each other all the time. We're in frequent discussion with each other. And we have formal and informal ways of discussing individual cases with each other. Um, and rectal cancer is an absolute example of where you do need to involve more than one type of specialist. Um, our, the bulk of our cases that we see are of those who are needing preoperative treatment and our approach that is evolving all of the time um, in response to what we're seeing internationally and nationally. There has been a recent emphasis on adult onset rectal cancer and there are probably more questions and answers when it comes to adult um, or young adult onset um, because of how new it is. And the only way that we're gonna be able to answer those questions is through true collaborative research, ideally in the, in the um, setting of a designated clinic for, for those patients. Um, because of how we've learned in our experience that when you bring everyone together in one room or in one computer, as the case may be in a Zoom call, you can actually bring forward changes that can help the service and improve the quality of care for patients. I'd like to thank you all for your attention um, and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. So feel free to unmute yourselves at this point and, and ask whatever you want. That was a great lecture, Adrian. Thanks so much. Um, so welcome. Joy <clears throat> has a question. She said, how often can a PET scan be done repeated if there's reoccurrence? So PET scans are just to put everyone on the same page. So a PET scan is a scan where you're injected with radioactive sugar or glucose. And then that sugar floats around your body and is ordinarily taken up by every organ. And the amount that it takes up will vary. So the liver and brain and heart, for example, take up a lot because they're very active. The reason that we use them as oncologists is to make help with decision making. So if we see something that may be subtle or not on a scan, we may want more clarification. So a PET scan will help in that sense in that it will tell us whether an area is taking up more sugar um, than normal. So if we see, for example, a lesion or a mass liver and it's clearly taking up a lot of sugar, that would um, surmise us to conclude that there was cancer in the liver. And that may prevent doing a biopsy, for example, if, you're, if, the, if it's very clear cut. Um, so there are pros and cons to every, every tool that we use. So there's a lot more radiation used in a PET scan. So they're not to be used all the time. So particularly if you're being um, cured of your cancer, you have to be conscious of the amount of radiation that you're receiving over your lifetime. So getting a CT scan done every six months, which would be the norm for follow-up after diagnosis of rectal cancer, would be a far less radiation dose than getting PET scans every, every six months. Um, so we tend to use them sparingly, and that's come from a lot of international guidelines, including from ASCO, that conference that I mentioned, which is the world's largest cancer-specific conference and, and organization. They have come down very harsh on what they call the over-reliance on PET scans and using that for routine use. Um, many of my patients may only get one PET scan um, at the time of their diagnosis or potential recurrence. And we often will not do one ever again because we can get a lot of our questions answered from doing CT, for example, which as I said, has less radiation in it. Um, so there isn't a specific 
um, number of how many you should be getting. Of course, it's difficult to comment on individual cases without knowing the details. But in general, there would have to be a really good reason to be using um, PET scans on a regular basis. And you would have to question why you're not using a CT scan. Does anybody else have any questions or? And the other thing that I will say that ASO have come out and said that routinely doing a PET scan for let's say a person is diagnosed with rectal cancer and the CT and MRI are telling you that the tumor is confined to the pelvis so it hasn't spread somewhere else. Um, doing a PET CT is not indicated in that because you're not going to get any additional information and all you're going to get is um, more exposure to radiation. Okay, well, I guess that's it for questions. Um, thank you so much, Adrian. That was just so, that was a great lecture. Um, You're very so welcome. I really appreciate you taking time to speak to the group. Um, and uh, thanks again. Thanks You're for everybody welcome. joining. All right, I guess we'll end. Um, thanks, everybody. All right, thanks, guys. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Okay, thanks. Bye. Bye.